It's week 50 here at IT Pro TV. We've got some great stories from Kubernetes as well as some updates on recent security fixes with Intel's IME as well as Mac OS High Sierra. That's all coming up in the IT Pro TV podcast starting right now. Hello and welcome to the IT Pro TV podcast. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, joined as always by Don Pazette. Don, how are you doing today? I'm doing just well, ready to jump into another week in review. And it is week 50 of 2017. We're almost uh, at an end here of this year. And there's uh, a lot of good articles today and uh, surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, but a lot of them actually relate back to things we talked about in the last couple episodes. We've been able to see some developments, which will be uh, pretty cool. But uh, with that, let's let's just kind of jump right in, Don. So I know last time uh, we talked about uh, Kubernetes and uh, some announcements they had around AWS um, with the AWS conference going on and not to be outdone. Um, Azure has some announcements with uh, with Kubernetes now. Yeah, the uh, the big deal there has been that uh, you know there's been this battle over how to manage uh, you know massive container deployments. That when you deploy an application in a container and it needs to auto scale, we need something to be able to manage that. And and there've been several different technologies like uh, Docker Swarm and and Kubernetes. Uh, we're competing technologies. And the the exciting part here is that 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 competition, that battle, it is kind of over now. Like Kubernetes is pretty much the winner. So. Amazon's acceptance of that was a big deal. That was a huge announcement last week. Uh, and this week, it has just snowballed, right? So Azure is now uh, integrated. And Azure actually already had support for Kubernetes. What's big here is they're now doing serverless support. And we're starting to see more of this. You know, the, the whole point of containers was that if you're a developer and you, you know, maybe you are like the PHP master and so you write this PHP-based web application or JavaScript, Node.js, whatever, right? And you create this amazing application you want to be able to bring it into production and throw it online as fast as you can and not have to worry about the infrastructure underneath. The problem was if you just did a single container, that wasn't a big deal, right? You could throw the container up into AWS or Azure and there you go, you went. But if you wanted to auto scale, now you needed something like Docker Swarm or, or Kubernetes that you had to know how to configure and you had to know how to set up. And there was a lot of work to it and, and it made the developers you know, it's, it's supposed to be DevOps, where they do some development, some operations. It made them do more and more operations. So by going serverless, what Amazon and now Microsoft are doing is saying, look, you write your application, you write it containerized, and then you send the containers up to our system, and you don't even know about the virtual machines that are running under the hood. You don't have to see uh, you know, what their load is or how they're configured or whether they need updates. That's completely, totally managed. So now the developers get to focus more on developing. So we are starting to see that spread out. And if you're in the DevOps world or if you're an IT person like a sysadmin looking to, to work in that area, uh, you know, Kubernetes is, is a technology that you need you need it on your radar. You need to be looking at that. Uh, just learning about Docker helps, but knowing how Kubernetes works as well is going to help you make sure you can get those applications into production. So if I'm someone that uh, that uses Kubernetes in my development workflow, uh, based on this announcement and, and the one we talked about last time, is there one that looks better to me than the other between Azure and AWS? Or, or do I, does this announcement mean that they're kind of both on the same playing field now? Well, so th this ties into a, another article. So that th that news was brought to you straight from from Microsoft, right? That was an Azure announcement. Um, but along the sidelines, there was another announcement from Bitnami, and uh, you know they are basically rolling out a a new Kubernetes solution. The interesting thing here is that by containerizing an application, you make sure that you create it in a consistent environment. So now I can go and I can deploy it in Azure and I know it'll work. Or I can deploy it in AWS, and I know it'll work. And maybe I deploy it in AWS, and then something happens, and I get frustrated. I don't want it in AWS anymore. I can move it and take it over to Google Compute. And they all run that consistent containerized environment, so the application works exactly the same on each one. Even better, though, is if you say, man, I want to go multi-cloud. If you want the best redundancy possible, then you spread your application across Azure and AWS or Google Computer or all three of them, right? But all of the servers, serverless solutions, the, the one from AWS, the one from Azure, the one from Google, they're single cloud, right? Like they'll spread you across multiple data centers. Uh, with Amazon, it's easy to go across regions with uh, Microsoft, same way. 
but it's all within Google or it's all within Amazon. What if one of them has an outage, right? It, it's happened. It's happened to Amazon. And so it's a, a realistic thing to have to plan for. When you use their deployments, you're in their world. And so if you want to go multi-cloud, now you've got to interact with Kubernetes in two different clouds. So what Bitnami did is they said, man, you know, Kubernetes is neat, but it's really hard to deploy. And so they did what they always do. And I guess maybe I should back up a little bit, because if you don't know who Bitnami is, they're a fairly big name in the cloud world. If you go to like the AWS marketplace and look for an AMI and search for something, they make pre-built images that are basically turnkey. They call them full stack. Uh, so for example, uh, WordPress, right? Let's say I need to install WordPress. WordPress is more than just the WordPress application because you also have to have a relational database, usually like MariaDB or MySQL. You need Apache as a web server. You need all these different components to make it work. Well, Bitnami has an image that already has all of that configured. And when you deploy it, the first thing it does is have you reset the passwords and the randomized salt that's used for, uh, for password encryption. So you get a properly configured and secure deployment without a whole ton of knowledge of how that underlying infrastructure works. They've now done that with Kubernetes. So they, they, uh, they just put out the announcement for it that they, uh, they're doing uh, what they call kubaps. And the kubaps, uh, this was uh, in an article on itprotoday.com, uh, that kubaps are applications that are Kubernetes containers that are ready to deploy, that are that are already configured, that you don't have to necessarily understand that underlying infrastructure. And now we can take those and we can deploy those out into Azure or AWS. So when you ask which platform is better, technically the, there isn't one that's better. It's, it's the same system that uh, is being deployed in a global network that is extremely stable and robust, you know, powerful things. Uh, it's just how we take advantage of them. So you, you might want to take a step back and say, hey, it's great that Microsoft has a serverless solution. It's great that Amazon has a serverless solution. But maybe I don't want that because I need to be able to go multi-cloud. So always always keep that in mind. Gotcha. And, and these announcements are coming out right now because there's a conference going on um, out in Austin, which Don and I had, and I had a debate <laughs> about. Uh, so it's Kubernetes. And uh, you said Kube apps, mm -hmm. uh, but then we were debating whether it's called CubeCon, which would be just a, a, a terrible, terrible name for it <laughs> based on uh, you know their branding. But it makes a lot of sense just to look at that word and think that. And we actually looked at a couple of uh, their official videos where uh, they seem to say both, yeah. CubeCon and CubeCon. So they have no idea where they are, but there's an event going on with a bunch of I think it, uh, Kub Kubernetes heads. It depended on your, your accent, because it seemed like the, the, Canadian. the, the yeah. British uh, people were, were usually saying Cube, and yeah, yeah who knows. Sorry. So anyway, that's going on now, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's um, some more announcements coming out um, about other partnerships and relationships uh, very soon. Uh, following up on another article that we had uh, uh, discussed recently, we talked a lot about the um, Apple uh, Mac OS High Sierra 10.3... 10.13. 10.13.2 uh, vulnerability, was it? No. Uh, the vulnerability one... started in 10.13 flat. Flat, okay. Yeah. And that was where basically you could type root a bunch and uh, <laughs> and get into an account. I love the, the thing that you could just type the, uh, the thing and it would say, no, it doesn't work. Type it again, type it again, and all of a sudden it works. But anyway, um, uh, the fixes are out. And so they've rolled out now 10.13.2, um, which does some other things, and that's what they're trying to promote in these articles. But <laughs> it's yeah. well, what's really great about it is it's actually fixing uh, those bugs. Yeah, before the show, I had sent Peter this article, and it's from Mac Rumors, you know, and they're highlighting, oh, 10.13.2 is out. It's got some improvements for third-party USB audio devices. And and Peter asked me, he said, why do we care about those audio devices? Yeah. And I said, I don't care about those. I just wanted to remember to announce that 10.13.2 was out. And the main reason there is that uh, if you – if you follow the timeline of our show, two weeks ago, we announced that 10.13 had this root exploit. It was bad. You know, here's how you can kind of fix it. And then 10.13.1 came out, and Apple kind of botched it a little bit. And so the 10.13.1 the could actually undo the fix and bring the exploit back again if you weren't careful. So that was in last week's show. So this week, we get to announce that 10.13.2 is out, and this time it actually fixes the problem. So... If you don't have the patch, 10.13.2 fixes it. If you do have the patch, 
10.13.2 doesn't undo it. Yeah, that's <laughs> so the important part. It's the first update that actually solves that problem. So that's what we care about. Uh, I don't really care about USB audio. <laughs> <laughs> and we, yeah, and, and I was saying, what is this, USB-C audio? Great. That's yeah. Great. Uh, I don't have any devices yet that work there. Um, but the, the other thing uh, as well is 10.13.2. 10.13.3 beta is also released now, so whatever uh, bugs exist in 10.13.2 <laughs> that we don't fully know about yet, whatever the next exploit is, that fix is coming now in 10.13.3, yeah. so uh, that beta is out, so... Those of you that enjoy those betas, go ahead and jump on that. Apple's gotten a lot more tight on on what these updates contain. It used to be they contained a bunch of stuff. And if you look like Mac Rumors, they summed it up here. There's three main things, right? Uh, improves compatibility with USB audio devices, improves voiceover navigation when viewing PDF documents, and improves compatibility of Braille displays with mail. So that's it. They don't even mention the yeah. security fix. Oh, right? and that thing um, where people could get into your computer, that's... Yeah, that's and that's part of a couple of years ago, Apple started splitting off the uh, security release notes from the feature release notes. But because there's so few features in each of these updates now that basically by the time they release one, they're already working on the next update. And, and so that's what we're seeing now is that beta is, is in the works. Yeah, it's kind of how those teams work in cycles where one team's working on point, the point .3 beta while the other team's uh, working on getting point two out and then they'll they'll go to point four probably i'm not sure how many teams they've got but um that's uh, that's how they set that up but uh so moving on then to the to the next article because uh, hopefully that's it for the uh high sierra yeah, and i sure. might actually go ahead and and put high sierra on my new machine <laughs> now we'll see i'll give it a couple days um but we wanted to talk about uh crossover and crossover bringing uh the the latest and greatest uh, of last year's uh, Microsoft <laughs> Office, uh, so Microsoft uh, Office 2016 uh, to Linux, and that's uh, that's got to be exciting for you, doesn't it? You know, it, it was a, it was it was really timely. This article, I, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, Crossover, if you're not familiar with it, there's a company called Code Weavers, and they create an application called Crossover. Uh, they have Crossover for Linux, and they have Crossover for Mac, and and the goal of the project is to allow you to run Windows applications on top of Linux or Windows applications on top of Mac. And they do that by emulating the, uh, or it's not so much emulating as it is like recreating the Windows API. So all the calls that a Windows application would expect to make to the Windows operating system, it can do to crossover and crossover then translates that into Linux calls or into uh, Mac OS or BSD calls at that point. So uh, they're able to handle that. and. The reason I said this was timely is that we just had Black Friday here in the U.S., which companies do huge sales, and Code Weaver was one of them. Uh, they did a, I think it was like 50% off for a license, so you could you could buy it really cheap. And I remember seeing on Reddit where somebody announced it, and a person responded and said, why would I want to pay for that piece of junk? The newest version of Office it runs is 2013. And now they make the announcement that they've got uh, support for Office 2016. They've been pretty far behind, right? Office 2013 came up four years ago, and if you ran Crossover, that was the newest one you could run. Uh, a little background on Code Weavers. Uh, if you're familiar with the Wine project, Wine lets you run Windows apps on top of Linux. Uh, Wine is an acronym. It stands for Wine is Not an Emulator uh, because they're <laughs> recreating the API. Uh, it sounds the same, right? They are the same. They're the same project. But Wine is open source. It's free. Anybody can download it. You can run it and use it. Crossover is a paid commercial product, and the funding goes to developing the, the fixes and updates that power Wine. So they develop for Crossover and then pass on that technology to Wine. So there's an argument where people will say, I'm just going to run Wine, and Wine will run Office 2013 as well. So again, why would I bother with Crossover? But the money that you pay to Crossover is really supporting the Wine project. So that's the way I always look at it is don't feel like you're buying the most superior way to run Windows apps on Linux. The best way to do that is a virtual machine and pay Microsoft for a license. But think of it as supporting the Wine project, right? Uh, unfortunately, the, the big deals are gone, so it's full price today. But it is neat that you can run the full version of Office 2016 right on top of Linux, and it actually does work. That was their, their number one request for the, the current version of Crossover. And now, have you had experience actually using this at all? Because I'm curious what the experience is like there. Well, I guess it's more important if you were using it um, on a Mac than on a Linux machine, because you can, you can buy Office for a Mac. You, you can. So you can. Is, the, is the experience better then because you're 
you know, they, obviously it was created for Windows originally, sure. and, and there might be some things that, that function a little bit better there. You know, I, I've used it on a Mac, and I've used it on Linux. I, I run Red Hat Enterprise Linux on my laptop. Uh, and while you can buy Office for Mac, there's certain applications you can't, like Microsoft Visio. Uh, and Microsoft Project, neither of those have a Mac version. And so when I when I had a Mac, I actually used Crossover to be able to run Visio and uh, and to be able to run uh, Microsoft Project. On Linux, y you know, you can do the same thing, uh, but you can't buy a version of Office. So a lot of times, I'll use the web-based version of, of Microsoft Office, uh, or I'll use LibreOffice. And and LibreOffice is good, but Microsoft Office is really, I mean. It, it's a really good product. Even if you hate Microsoft, like just as far as a word processor and a spreadsheet go, they're really advanced on that stuff. And Crossover works pretty well. Where Crossover doesn't work so well is once you get outside of their directly supported apps. So in, in theory, you should be able to run just about any application. But you'll find that a lot of them have problems where uh, maybe they can't print or the video gets garbled or they don't resize right. That happens. And and they, they're constantly working and trying to improve the applications. You can get in there and mess with them and try and, and fix it. Uh, but if you're just looking to run Office or you know something that they directly support, they have a couple of video games they support. If you're just looking for that, it's great. Really, really works well. Uh, outside of it, expect to, to do a lot of tuning and tweaking. So in this before, could you run... Office, but just you'd be missing some features because, like you said, you could you could run the earlier version of Office, mm -hmm. but if if you tried to to use this to run Office twenty sixteen before, you just find some hiccups. Or? Uh, the the main problem was the .NET framework okay. that Office depends on the .NET framework and it hadn't quite been ported over to work. So if you couldn't install the dependencies, you couldn't install the suite. Uh, and even if you overrode that and got past it, a lot of times the applications would hang on launch. Yeah. And so you wouldn't even get in. It wasn't even like partially usable. Gotcha. All right. Well, uh, shifting gears now uh, to our next story. Uh, this one comes from the ProtonMail uh, blog. Uh, but they are releasing ProtonMail Bridge uh, email encryption for Outlook Thunderbird and Apple Mail. So um, if you've used ProtonMail before um, as an iOS app or an Android app, um, it looks like this is talking about a little bit more encryption on the desktop client, correct? Right. So, um, you know, encryption to an email server has been around for a long time. Most people, if you're using SMTP, POP3, IMAP, they all support SSL now. And so you've got encryption between you and the server. But the, the kind of holy grail of email security has been end-to-end -end encryption, right? If I send you an email, Peter, I want to know that it's encrypted when it leaves my computer, and it's still encrypted when it gets to your computer. That way, when it's on the server, it's encrypted. And the, the idea here is that if your service provider tries to open your mailbox, they just see a bunch of encrypted mail. Or if a government does a warrantless uh, you know, inspection of your mailbox, which in the US they can do, uh, then they, they just see encrypted email. You're, you're protected. If you're just relying on the encryption between you and the server, like Gmail, right? With Gmail, you go to their website. You're using SSL between you and Gmail. But your email is stored unencrypted right there in the mailbox on, on Google servers. So if there's a, a warrant applied, uh, or even a warrantless one, uh, the government can go in there and access your mailbox. Or a Google employee that just gets bored, right? That happened a few years ago. Uh, there was a Google employee got in trouble for that. So uh, how do we protect that? And the challenge has been not making it possible, but making it easy. Because we've had PGP, pretty good privacy. That, that's been around for over 20 years. So I could write my email in PGP and have it encrypted and then take the encrypted ciphertext and drop it into an email and then send that along. And then the person on the other end would be able to, to decrypt it if they copied it and pasted it into PGP on their end. And I would have to have their private key. So I'm sorry, I gotta get this right. <laughs> I would have to have their public key yeah. so that I can encrypt. If I had their private key, there's a whole nother problem to deal with. Um, but if I had their, their public key, I could encrypt and then send it to them, and they could decrypt it with their own private key. That system has two problems, right? Problem number one, the key exchange. Your average person, like if I'm going to email my mom, she doesn't know how to do a key exchange, and so the system starts to break down, right? Problem two, I'm already in my email client, and now I've got to go to another program to write my email and then copy and paste it. It's not a seamless thing. So if you want it to be easy, if you want adoption, you've got to make it easy. And so that's what ProtonMail is trying to do. You know, they specialize in encrypted mail. They say, look, you have an encrypted connection to our servers. We encrypt your email on our servers. And then when we send it to somebody else, we require an encrypted connection there. But the reality is that 
they could still get served with a warrant. They could still get you know, uh, put in a position by a government where they have to turn over the information. So it's in their best interest to have you doing end-to-end encryption. And they, they released an Android app. They released a iOS app, uh, like a mail client you could use that did that. But on the desktop, people don't want to give up their Microsoft Outlook or Thunderbird or you know, whatever email client it happens to be that, that you're using, um, you know, maybe Inky Mail or, or one of the other ones that are, are starting to catch on. Um, those, each client has its own little set of features and you want to use it, but most of them do not support end-to-end encryption. So what ProtonMail did is they released something called a bridge. And, uh, you know, they have a good diagram on their website. Let me, let me pull up the diagram. Uh, basically, it's a little program that you run on your computer, and it acts like a proxy. And you take your mail client, and instead of pointing your mail client at Pro, uh, ProtonMail, you point the mail client at yourself, right? You point it at this application that's running right on your system. And the, the uh, bridge software, it's what connects out to ProtonMail. So now all of your email is flowing through this little software application, and that application takes care of the encryption and decryption. So when you send an email, the email leaves, let's say you're using Thunderbird. So you write the email in Thunderbird, it's unencrypted. You click send, it connects to this application, and I haven't seen yet whether it's unencrypted at that stage or not. It might actually use encryption there, but it's it's local at that point, so it may not. And then it hits the bridge, the bridge software encrypts it, and then sends it over the network. So now it's encrypted as it crosses the wire. And if you're emailing another ProtonMail user, it can travel all the way over to them, and when it hits their bridge, it decrypts, and now it goes into their Outlook or Thunderbird or, or whatever. So it's neat that they're doing that. You get to use whatever email client you're used to. They show Mac Mail, Outlook, Thunderbird, um, and you still get to use that experience that you're used to, but you get encryption. Now, there's a few things they don't really address in this announcement that you do need to be aware of, which is if your email client doesn't support encryption, once it gets the email from the bridge, it's decrypted, and it'll be saved to your drive in in an unencrypted form, uh, which means that your data at rest is not encrypted. It's, it's at risk. So you need to couple this with disk encryption and, and other things to make sure that you're protected because at a minimum, at an absolute minimum, your mail client is going to store it in RAM unencrypted. So your email is still accessible. This is not a perfect solution, but it is a neat one that at least introduces encryption to, uh, to clients that, that wouldn't already support it. So, so let's take Outlook for example. In in that situation, is is the email still going through Exchange, or is it? And, and when it does so, then is it it's encrypted at that point? Uh, in the initial version of this bridge, they're only supporting their own service. Okay. So you would have uh, you know Outlook connecting to your Proton Mail account. I see. And it would you would take Outlook and you would configure it to point it to the local bridge, and the local bridge would just automatically connect to Proton Mail. If you also had Outlook set up to connect to like an Exchange server. It would go direct to the exchange server. That that wouldn't pass through the bridge. And what they're saying is you can do that, uh, and you can drag and drop the messages from Outlook or from your exchange server and drop them into ProtonMail, and then they'll get encrypted and sent there. But it's too late at that point, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so in the future, I don't know if they're going to change this. I, I think it would be neat if they did to support any server. But right now, they're just supporting theirs, so it would only work with ProtonMail accounts. So so how does that work? How how do, how is that key? transferred then because you know use the other example i've got to pass you a key whether that happens once you know Mm -hmm. offline and then you have that and i have that and we can send information but if i'm just sending you an email how does how does it know on your end what that key is to to decrypt that data so all this stuff works with a with a key pair right so you have a public key and a private key and if you want two people to email each other and, and do it securely then we have to have copies of each other's keys well I don't want to give you my key that can unencrypt anything that I've got, right? So think of it like, um, gee, I don't know. If you buy an expensive car, so this is something I haven't done, but (laughs) if you buy an expensive car, they give you two sets of keys, right? They'll give you one key, which is the one that'll start the car and open the glove box and open the trunk. And then they give you another key that they call the- uh, The valet key. The valet key, that's it. Uh, That- It'll start the car so a valet can park it, but it won't open the glove box, and it won't open the trunk. Well, that's kind of how key pairs work, is that you have a public key and a private key. The private key 
can encrypt and decrypt data on your behalf, right? The public key can only encrypt data. You use it to encrypt, but you can't decrypt with the public key, right? You can only decrypt with the private key. So if you and I, like, let's say we want to use PGP, right? We, which is a great solution, or GPG, the GNU Privacy Guard, that's the open source version of it. Um, if we wanted to use GPG, you would need to generate a key pair, and I would need to generate a key pair. And then I need to give you my public key, and you need to give me your public key, right? Mm -hmm. And we can just email those to each other, because if somebody steals my public key, who cares, right? That just means they can encrypt things. They can't decrypt anything, so it's it's safe. In fact, a lot of people will take those public keys and post them on the internet. Uh, there's, there's key servers that are out there, so you can make them public. People can find them on a key directory. MIT ran a big one for a long time uh, that you can post those out there, so it's easy to get those keys. And if I want to email you, I just take your public key, encrypt the data, and then send it to you, right? And then you've got your private key, so you decrypt it and see it. But that's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, as I describe all that, you kind of hear all these moving pieces. So what ProtonMail is doing is they're trying to make that automatic, where, hey, when you sign up for a ProtonMail account, they're generating these keys. And so you've got your private key and the public key, they hold a copy of it, and any other ProtonMail subscriber can have access to that. Or you can send that key to people outside of ProtonMail so they can email you securely. So that, that's what they're trying to do and operate in that space. There's so many places where this could go wrong when yeah. an end user gets involved. And, and that's what the bridge is trying to serve, uh, trying to, to fix. But it's not perfect. And, and I, I kind of see like little chinks in this where it's, it's not going to quite, uh, quite be that, that armor that we need it to be. But it's a first step. They just announced the product. And so I imagine it's going to evolve, and, and we'll just want to keep an eye on it. So is it is it still a situation though where if if um, there is a, a warrant is that is that information on the server in a way that it could be decrypted? So in, in this case, the email and, and data would be on the server in an encrypted form already, mm -hmm. and they don't have the private key, so gotcha. they can't they decrypt. Need the private key, sure. You, they would need the private key. You have the private key, and that's it. So now, if you were arrested, then you may have to turn over that private key. That's sure. been some some legal kind of soft ground lately. Uh, the other thing, though, is what happens if you lose your private key? That's it. Yeah. The data you, is you gone. You lose that data. <laughs> so. Yeah, and it's not a matter of if I'm arrested, Don, but, <laughs> uh, but now I remove all my, I'll move my, all my illicit communications there. I've been doing it like uh, uh, General Petraeus, where I was just putting things in the, uh, in the <laughs> drafts folder and then giving you my account access and... And that's a whole. That's a whole. You know, the sad part about so. you know where he learned that from. No, that was like that was how like Al Qaeda Homelander. was. Commu that was how Al Qaeda was communicating, and they were using Hotmail that way. And they would do a draft. They would never actually send the email. And I love the fact that he knows that they were using that. Shows that it's not a great system because we're already aware of it. But. Hey, you know. So you could use it to, uh, you know, commit international terrorism and violence, or you could use it to cheat on your wife. Yeah. So whichever way you want to go. <laughs> That's why I only send letters anymore. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, shifting gears now, uh, another Microsoft announcement. This one comes from IT Pro today as well, uh, not to be confused with IT Pro TV at itpro.tv. Um, <laughs> but this one, uh, Microsoft releases the first cross platform. Platform SQL Operation Studio. And wow, as exciting as that sounds, I'm going to need your help with this one. Uh, All right. So, that a little bit. last year, Microsoft had a big announcement that was, it was pretty jaw dropping, which was that they were releasing SQL Server, one of their staple products, one of their core money making products. They were releasing SQL Server that would run on top of Linux. And that was just unheard of. You know, most people don't realize that SQL Server is one of Microsoft's oldest products. It was developed in the 80s. And it's a, a database system. It competes with Oracle and MySQL, uh, MariaDB, those guys. It's a relational database. Uh, and it's very powerful. It's got a lot of features in it, a lot of bells and whistles. It, it uses SQL, like all the other guys, but it actually has what's called Transact SQL, so advanced features that, that goes a little bit beyond. It's a really, really cool product that makes them a ton of money. So it's always run on top of Windows Server. You pair the two together. They released it for Linux. And that was pretty impressive that they would do that. It shows Microsoft kind of moving into that uh, where they're embracing Linux as a server, not as a desktop. Uh, and so, uh, so they made that announcement. That was really cool. You could run the server there. But none of the management tools would work there. All the management tools required a Windows desktop. So you could run the SQL Management Studio and the uh, Query Analyzer and all that other stuff on Windows, 
not on Linux. They, they gave like a basic CLI utility on the, the Linux side, which honestly was enough. But now they've announced that they're replacing the SQL Server Management Studio, the SSMS. It was introduced over 12 years ago. I, I remember when it came out, because back in the SQL 7, SQL 6, 5 days, the, the management interface for SQL was really clunky, really simple. Um, and then they changed it from the, the regular admin style interface over to the Visual Studio. You, you felt like a developer when you were inside of the, the management studio. And they did that quite a while ago, uh, and it's a big interface. It has so much overhead to it, and it's kind of clunky, uh, but it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed in like four versions of SQL. So now they're announcing a change. They're going to an all-new studio, uh, which the IT Pro Today guys have a, a screenshot of, uh, but they're going to an all-new studio, and it's cross-platform. And so now they're saying, look, you'll be able to run the graphical management tools for your server, not just on Windows, but also on Linux and kind of embracing that. Uh, and Mac OS, that was the surprising part for me, was they haven't supported anything on Mac yeah. as far as SQL is concerned, but now you'll be able to run this. Uh, and what it actually stems from, and, and we're going to see more of this, is what it stems from, though, is Microsoft Azure. That if you deploy a SQL server in Azure, they have Azure SQL, and that means they have to make all the management tools web embedded. And if they're web embedded, if they're progressive web apps or whatever, then who cares what platform it is that they're running on? So we're starting to see that where Microsoft is saying, we're going to take our critical servers, our things like SQL, and start to make them platform agnostic, which is really, really cool. Um, I, I'm curious to see if they do that with Exchange. I'm really curious to see if they do it with Active Directory, because it would be so neat to say, I need a, a directory server, but I'm an all Linux shop. Oh, I, I can take Microsoft's AD and stick it on top of my Linux servers. That would be really powerful stuff. Now, this is exciting and all, but couldn't I have just used Crossover to, to run SQL you on, know, my, you, on my machine? Or, and that's, that's probably going to require the .NET framework. You, well. uh, you might be able to. Look at a call I, I have back not there. Tried. I'm acting like I've, I've actually paid attention. I've understood how things work, and, and I'm, I'm putting it together. I'm pretty proud of myself on that one. So if anyone has used Crossover for SQL, I'd love to hear about it. But I'm guessing, I'm guessing if Office 2016 didn't work, yeah, then uh, higher the end, probably highly not. powerful... Uh, SQL did not work. Um, speaking of things that don't work, uh, <laughs> switching gears now. Uh, so we've talked uh, recently about the Intel management engine and uh, some issues it was having with System76, where people found that you could um, get into that, basically, and uh, and have some access to, uh, to people's machines uh, on different versions of Linux. And, uh, and now Intel management engine uh, has a critical firmware update, which... Um, sounds great. I mean, you're like, maybe maybe they're fixing it so you can get in and disable things. But uh, really, it, it looks like it's just opened up some other concerns about uh, IME. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the uh, the original uh, exploit, it wasn't like System76 didn't discover it. It was, yeah. um, it was, a, it was two Russian uh, security researchers. And I, I found the, the tweet that they did, but I'm not seeing their names. This one's... Uh, I'm going to say it wrong, but Maxim Goriachi, uh, either way. So, so people discovered that there was a way to break into that management engine. We, we reported on that. Uh, and then System76 just found a way to like turn off the management engine, just shut it down. But in all of this, Intel has been uniquely kind of silent. They, they really just haven't gotten out and said a whole lot. So the, the big news item here is that they finally said something, and... It is not the response that I expected. So I've got their announcement here. They, they've done Intel Security Advisory 00086, and it is announcing that there are, let me find it here, seven CVEs that, uh, you know, common vulnerability and exploits uh, that have been detected for the management engine. So not one flaw, but seven different flaws. So they they have acknowledged that, yes, we've got a problem in the, in the ME, and they've made a fix for it, sort of, right? And this is the part that kind of frustrated me a little bit, uh, is they're not giving out the fix. Instead, it's up to your motherboard manufacturer to give you the fix. It turns out that while Apple, I mean, Apple, while Intel makes the processor, uh, they don't have a consistent way to deploy the update into the processor, and they run the risk of, of actually damaging the CPU, which would be a problem because we kind of need that to work. So they're relying on the motherboard manufacturers to safely push the update into the processor and fix it. And 
I'm kind of curious because we have no insight into this. This is all closed, all binaries that are, are compiled, and we have no idea what's actually going on. I'm curious whether they're actually changing anything in the CPU or if they're making the motherboard manufacturers block certain types of access. Because the the exploit that the Russian researchers found was a JTAG exploit, which JTAG, um, you know, pretty much any electronic device has these like debug and troubleshooting connectors on their, their circuitry. And at the factory, when they manufacture them, they hook a test device up to be able to test it and make sure it works. Well, most devices have that exposed. In a CPU, it's too small. They can't do that. So in Intel CPUs, they actually activate the USB port on your computer. As long as your computer has power, the USB port is actually listening for the CPU. And you can plug a USB key in with an attack, and the CPU will process it even while the computer is turned off. As long as there's power plugged into the system, uh, it'll see that. And, and they found that they were able to actually get in there and, uh, and attack the management engine. So I wonder if Intel's actually patched the CPU or if they're just blocking that USB access. Because technically, once it leaves the factory, you don't really need that anymore. Uh, they might just be shutting that off. So I'm curious to see where it goes. Uh, but the two big takeaways from the news articles are that, uh, one, Intel says, yes, there's a problem. There's actually seven problems. And two, don't bother us about it. Go to your motherboard manufacturer and bother them about it because, you know, it's their fault. No. Well, I noticed something great. If you can, uh, if we can bring back up the article here for a second, uh, at the at the very bottom of the article, in the bottom left there, you see, uh, give us feedback. <laughs> Was this helpful? But but I love that you know it, you've got a spot to provide some feedback there, but it also lets you know we appreciate all feedback, but cannot reply or give product support. So. Would you like to send this yeah. information to a black hole? Uh, you Absolutely. can. Absolutely. And uh, and you'll get about as much uh, as much help if you were going to go right to the the motherboard manufacturer, probably. You know, another thing I did find interesting here, and and this is not the intent of the article, but I thought yeah. it was funny. Uh, the the official labeling of this is Intel SA-00086, right? So SA is a uh, security advisory, which is what this is, uh, and then it's numbered eighty six. So does that mean prior to now they've only had 85 advisories? Or does it mean that this is the 86th advisory for uh, the management engine? Well, let's see. And, and if it is the 86th advisory for the management engine, how have we not heard more about it prior to last month uh, with that many problems? But I, I thought it was a surprisingly low number, uh, which could indicate that Intel is doing a great job and they're not having to do too many uh, uh, security advisories, but... I, uh, but they're I don't planning have a... ahead, labeling it zero 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 eight six. So they're yeah, they're planning right. on at least uh, ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine <laughs> uh, future ones to come. So we'll see. But that'll be an interesting one for us to to watch over the next few weeks and see if more comes out, either from Intel or maybe the the motherboard manufacturers will put out the next response to this, and we'll be able to see uh, maybe a little bit more of, of the backstory uh, that they're able to provide. So we'll we'll definitely keep an eye on that and uh, and keep you posted. Uh, just a couple more stories for you today as we wrap up week 50. Uh, next, Microsoft releases ProcDump tool for Linux, which um, another great story about Microsoft and Linux working together and just another terrible, terrible name. Um, so ProcDump, done. All right. So, Talk to me about that. Uh, ProcDump, it's short for process dump. Uh, it lets you get information about a process, and, and specifically, it's performance information. So if you want to find out uh, how much time a process is taking to execute or CPU utilization of a process and, and all that good stuff, you can get the information. Now, what's interesting here is not that they release this tool, because there's plenty of tools in Linux that already do this stuff. Uh, what's interesting here is that this is part of the sysinternal suite. Which the sysinternal suite, if you're from the Windows world, it's been around a long time. There was a developer named Mark Rosinovich who created just a whole series of tools that were really, really slick stuff. Uh, and most of us users, we gave them away for free. Uh, Microsoft eventually hired him. And so those tools became Microsoft tools. But they've always run on Windows. But here's the first one, ProcDump, that's come out of that whole collection of sysinternal stuff that has now been ported over to run natively on Linux. And... I would assume this is a result of Microsoft now developing in the Linux world, so they want their tools that their people are used to to be able to work here as well. So they brought it over, and, and you'll see like in, in this screenshot, this is on ghacks.net, uh, that they have uh, where they're executing ProcDump, and it even shows in the copyright here, ProcDump version 1.0, 
Sys Internals Process Dump Utility. Uh, so it's showing it, oh, actually, Mark Rusinovich is mentioned right there, uh, but it is a Microsoft product. So it shows Microsoft moving more stuff over there. I hope they bring some of the other tools over because there were some really cool ones in there. Uh, but the reality is there are Linux tools that do this stuff already. I mean, Perf, which is an extremely old Unix tool, can not only give me performance information on a single process, but on all of them. And it can build these time delayed databases and all sorts of really cool stuff. Uh, and that's a native tool. So for those of us that are in the Linux world, we're just going to stick to the tools we already have, right? But if you're a Windows admin making that move over to the Linux world, well, you're going to start seeing a lot of the tools that you're used to being there, and it makes it a lot easier to make that switch. So that's part of what Microsoft has been doing is trying to, trying to get their hooks in on the Linux world, which some people are really not happy about. Personally, I think it's great. I, I think it's all just you know, improving our ability to use Linux as a server and, and shows why uh, even on Azure, they spin up more Linux servers than Windows servers, which is a, an interesting statistic, uh, but that just shows how popular that's become as a platform. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't see any problem with, with options, and really that's all this is. And, and um, like you said, if it, if it lets someone coming from the Windows world be more comfortable, you know, maybe they'll they'll come over knowing that that system exists, and then they'll find out about those other ones and... and uh, Get more really entrenched with the with the Linux uh, operating system, so so that'll be helpful. Uh, all right, last one we wanted to bring up here. Uh, this kind of reminds me of the the whole uh, Intel IME thing um, from recently, but uh, some HP laptops, uh, Hewlett Packard laptops, are found to be hiding a deactivated keylogger, and this looks like something that comes from um, from the keyboard utility. And uh, again, sounds like one of those things that just wasn't turned off. <laughs> when it left the factory, but uh, you know that's that's one of those headlines that people read out there, and and probably makes you a little scared. All right, this is a good headline, I think. This is a uh, TechCrunch on MSN, and they said some HP laptops are hiding a deactivated keylogger. That's an honest headline, right? That really describes what's going on. The first headline for this I saw said HP laptop ship with hidden keylogger, and. I saw the headline, I'm like, ah, oh, great. You know, you got to go and find more information on this one. Uh, it reminded me of the Lenovo Silverfish scandal, where uh, basically they had this malware that was on their laptops from the factory. And so you would get it, and it was it was running the, the malware, and it would uh, leak some of your personally identifiable information. It was pretty pretty bad for a company to have that as part of their, their base image. And Lenovo fixed that pretty quick and, and got that taken care of. So that was my first thought was, oh, great. Now HP is shipping some malware. It turns out, though, that it's actually not that bad. And, and I kind of understand what happened. Um, this keylogger they're talking about, uh, it's not actually a straight up keylogger. It's not a here's an application designed to capture everything you do. What it is is debug functionality in the Synaptic driver. Uh, Synaptic is a company that makes practically every touchpad in every laptop ever <laughs> that if you if you buy a a Dell laptop an HP laptop a, a Lenovo they almost all have synaptic touchpads um Apple is a little bit different Apple I think makes their own at this point they they used to use synaptic so I mean these these guys they they make tons of touchpads uh, they make other stuff too but their main thing seems to be the touchpads that we find in laptops and so they had debug functionality built into their driver and if you enable the debugger, part of it is capturing all the, the keystrokes, right? And you might say to yourself, wait a minute, a touchpad, that's not a key. So why are we key logging that? Um, but touchpads these days are gesture driven and, and do all sorts of various other things that do get handled as keystrokes. Uh, um, the keyboard and touchpad on most laptops today, they're built in but the system treats them as USB devices. And a lot of times they'll show up as a USB HID or human interface device. And keyboards and touchpads show up the same way. Same thing with mice, they all show up as these HIDs. And that means that you debug and you capture the same way and you can't differentiate between one another. So it's, it's grabbing it all. Well, I say you can't, there probably is a way to differentiate, but this one would just grab everything. So it was debug functionality that was left in there, it turned off and researchers found it. And the, the risk here, the, the attack vector, so let's say I wanted to attack this. Uh, let's say that, oh, no, you got a Mac. People, well, let's, let's pretend this is an HP. All right, so you, you've got a, uh, an e-machine or a Packard Bell laptop. And, uh, <laughs> there you go. And so, so I, I want to I pull off an attack, right? What I would have to do is either gain physical access to his system 
or trick him into running an application that I sent him. So one way or another, somebody with privileges on the laptop is going to have to, to run a utility. I could, I could see that being done pretty easy by you. <laughs> it, it, could, it could happen. And, uh, and then it's going to change a little registry value, a little registry setting that turns on the debugger. And once it's on, it's capturing the keystrokes, right? Now, by default, it's not sending the keystrokes across the network. It's just storing them right there on the machine. But again, if I've compromised that machine somehow, then I can capture it. Now, there was a really good comment that I, I saw on, uh, I think it was on Reddit, uh, one of the various sites, where somebody said, wait a minute, if I could do all that, why wouldn't I just give him my own key logger? Yeah, just like, put why, your why, own, why, yeah. Why, yeah. If I'm, if I'm going to run a, a, an application for you, you just say, hey, put this USB stick in real quick and send me a file. And meanwhile, that's that's putting something malicious on my machine. You but can certainly do that. If, if you uh, if you scroll down in the article there, Don, at the very bottom, uh, it's got a link to, or above above oh, all the, uh, the ads, uh, the ads and, and uh, suggested things. The, the last line has a link to um, the, the list of uh, affected machines. Um, on HP's site, which is pretty helpful, but it says pretty much what you just said. It says a potential security vulnerability has been identified with certain versions of the Synaptics touchpad driver. Uh, a party would need administrative privileges in order to take advantage of the vulnerability, and neither Synaptics or HP has uh, access to customer data as a result of this issue. So yeah. it definitely, it's it's something that could be taken advantage of. Um, not the easiest uh, to take advantage of, but I, I think it was pretty cool reading the story of kind of how this um, was discovered, and then the person uh, immediately kind of reached out to HP and said, hey, do you know that this is here? Because they were trying to fix something in someone's machine. Um, I, I think they said they were trying to turn off the backlighting on the keyboard, oh, and okay. so they got into that um, that system, basically, saw something that was labeled kind of funny and said, oh, I wonder what this is. Turned out Again, it's not a key logger, but it happens to log keystrokes. Uh, so, um, you know, it's some, definitely something that uh, I'm glad it's something, someone good that found it yeah. and was able to, to report it up um, to HP's security response team. And, you know, ultimately on this one, uh, I, I don't know if it was just a mistake on Synaptic's part. Like maybe they don't normally leave the debugging functionality there, and this time they did. Uh, they didn't really do a lot of reporting on, on how far back this one went. Um, but it's... It's one of those kind of things where, by itself, it's actually not a big deal, right? And, and most people don't even really need to take action on it because it's very, very difficult to explo exploit by itself. But this is one of those type of vulnerabilities where if we couple it with another vulnerability or two or three, you know, you put these two things together, now you've got risk. Now you've got danger. The difference here, um, like if I install my own keylogger, antivirus products might find that. A user might notice the difference. But if I use the debugger in the Synaptic driver, the Synaptic driver, it's a driver. It's a signed driver by Windows. So Windows is going to treat that as trusted code that runs with full access to the, you know, the HAL and, and kernel mode uh, access. Uh, or actually, I guess it would be user mode. Well, either way. But it, it's trusted. So it could then collect all that data, and I wouldn't even notice. The antivirus products wouldn't see it. They would just think it was normal normal access. So that's the risk there. There is an attack vector that could be used, so you definitely want to patch this one, but it's not one of those where we've got to like rush out this second to, to patch. So another one where we just have to put a little little bit of perspective on it and, and just make sure we do our patches. Well, I, I can certainly say after uh, weeks 48 and 49's reviews, I was definitely worried about every piece of machinery uh, in my home from uh, Foscam cameras uh, to, you know, just my, my tablet and my uh, my MacBook. I feel a little bit better this week. Um, you know, the the, the vulnerabilities are, are small ones, and there's good announcements coming of things, and things are actually getting patched. So uh, definitely a good week. But uh, any, any closing thoughts there, Don? Uh, my main one is that after all these weeks of talking about patches and updates, it is neat that you haven't uh, applied patches or updates to your laptop. <laughs> well, I'm not running High Sierra here. But that, you know that's not the only vulnerability oh, that exists. Sure, of course. <laughs> I still haven't patched my my camera apparently, and so I, just knowing that you're watching me at home is is just a weird feeling. And you know, like GI Joe always said, knowing is half the battle. It, that means that there is another half of that battle. Yeah. That he, you know, but he never says what it is. So how am I supposed to know? <laughs> well, well, we'll see if we can figure that out next time. But uh, for now, we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up. Uh, if you like what you heard, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, please rate it. Please share it with your friends. And 
I've been asking uh, what I should say as the close here. So something like "Good night, have a pleasant tomorrow," or "Stay classy, San Diego." Those things are all taken. Uh, so we asked on Facebook and IT Pro TV's site, and and my personally. Um, so I'm going to workshop a few different ones over the next few podcasts. So uh, for now, Don, thanks, and until next time, try restarting it, uh, try unplugging it, and restarting it. There you go. That's so again. I'll have to I'll have to practice these. Yeah. But you need something shorter, like uh, "Winter is coming." You know, a little. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.